Let us stand as we are able. Together we read our gospel acclamation. Alleluia! Alleluia! Lord and Savior, open now your saving word. Let it burn like fire within us. Speak until our hearts are stirred. Alleluia! Lord, we sing for the good news that you bring. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the, wheats appeared, the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you will uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom and all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the gospel of our Lord. I invite you all to be seated. Bob, would you come up for our children's sermon? Bob, child of God. You can stand here. I'm going to have a little show and tell. Bob, have you ever seen this picture before? No. Good answer. I was afraid you had. I would have asked for you to say no. So can you see what it reads? Saint. Saint. It's a little strange, this text. So I'm going to write it out. So there's the, there's the S. There's the A. I call this hoity toity toity font. Okay, so that's one. Good job, Bob. Okay, I've got another one. Same strange text. Now, what does this one read? Sinner. Sinner. Good job, Bob. This is hard to read, it is hard to read. Well, still, let's write it out then. There's the S, the I, one in, one in, E-R. See, if there are little kids here, it'd be a spelling lesson, too. Okay, good job, Bob. Well, I've got, a th I've got a third picture, and I asked them last night, what's different about this picture? And they said, it's green. <laughs> it is green. Okay, so this is the same one from before, though, right? Saint? And it's the same one from before, right? Yeah. Last night the kid went, whoa! <laughs> this is a, an interesting graph, graphic here. But one of the things that Martin Luther said was that we are simultaneously saint and sinner. At the same time, we are made holy because God loves you and God has blessed us to be children of God. But at the same time, we sin over and over again, even though we don't want to. 
There's a scripture that says, the very good I want to do, I don't. The thing I don't want to do, that I do. We are, at the same time, though, saints, made holy and precious by God. You, Bob. And also, still, sinners. Well, uh, there's a story I like to tell about a little kid from preschool last year. We were talking about angels. And he said, I have an angel on this shoulder and a devil on this one. And each morning I flick the devil off the shoulder. We have that with us all the time. One of the things so that we can do, Bob, is say we're sorry. We're sorry for those things that we know we shouldn't do, that we want gone, but that are still part of who we are. And so I have these little books. And yeah, Bob, I'll give you one. But on one, it's a prayer journal. On one side it says, Saint. And you can write on this side all of the things that you are thankful for, all the good things that God has done for you. And then, on this side, you can write the things that you are sorry to God for, the things that you have done that you know you shouldn't have. Because this is just who we are. We are blessed, but we are also, um, we have fault. And so that is something I'm going to invite you to do, all of us to do, is to consider that the many blessings we have, those good things in our lives, like the wheat in our story, and also those things that hurt us, that we don't want, that we want to have removed, like the weeds in that story, and consider. Here you go, Bob. You can have that. Yes, don't, don't go. Because we're going to say an I'm sorry prayer to God. So let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes and think about, think about Jesus. Repeat after me. Uh, good morning, God. I'm sorry for the bad that I do. Help me to love you. Amen. Thank you, Bob, for your bravery in coming up here. I miss Aurora. You're good too, Bob, but I miss Aurora. Well, I have one more thing for show and tell today. And luckily, the people watching online, forgive me, Joyce, have a, the gift of the, the picture there. And it's all beautiful and colorful. But I'm going to uh, first start this sermon by saying, I have not been endorsed by Roundup or any other weed killer company, but every year I plant a garden, and I start off so hopeful and excited for that year. It's going to work this year. I'm going to water it. I'm not going to let the weeds get too overwhelming. And guess what? It's July, and this is my garden. You can't see it very well, But this is a moment of vulnerability as I share this shame-filled picture. Inside all of these weeds are some very healthy squash plants. And you can't see in this black and white picture here, but there are a few big, bright yellow blossoms in there that eventually will grow into beautiful squash. And I'll have to pull back the weeds to find them, but... I know and trust and believe that they're there. So there you have it, my embarrassing story of weeds. But it's so easy for weeds to overcome when things are left unattended. Well, today's parable is that very story of that all too common occurrence of weeds overwhelming good plants. The story, this parable that Jesus talks about today, he references a specific kind of weed called a bearded darnel. And it's a devil of a weed, this bearded darnel. In biblical terms, it's known as tares. So some of your Bibles might even call this the parable of the wheat wheat and the tares. But this this weed's roots surround the roots of good plants, sucking up the precious nutrients there and, and the water. And so it's impossible to root out that weed without damaging the good crop. 
Above ground, on the surface, darnel looks identical to wheat until it bears seed. I have a picture online that has green wheat and green bearded darnel right next to one another, indistinguishable from one another, indistinguishable. But above ground, though they look the same, when the seed is harvested, the bearded darnel seed can cause hallucinations and even death. It's a devil weed, I told you. No wonder Jesus uses this weed to illustrate evil incarnate. Well, in Jesus' time, the religious leaders, those trusted leaders in the synagogues, sure looked like wheat-producing plants, but they most certainly were not. They were as false and deadly as any bearded darnel. Well, upon first read, this parable of the wheat and the weeds could be discerned as a us-versus-them situation. There are the good seeds of the children of the kingdom, and then there are the weeds of the children of the evil one. Well, that could easily lead us into the temptation to sort out who are the evildoers and who are the children of the kingdom. But at closer read, however, this parable reveals a warning. Lest we think we have it all figured out how to judge who is the wheat and who are the weeds, think again. Dangerous and destructive things happen when we do the sorting of wheat and weeds. How many times in history has scripture been used, even weaponized, to justify evil behavior? When people take the seat of the judge to determine who is wheat and who is weed, what is right and what is wrong, devastating things happen. It makes my skin crawl to think about slave owners sitting in their church hundreds of years ago, pleased at their interpretation of scripture that justified their owning and abusing and oppressing of other people. And then there's the scripture from Ephesians chapter 5, one of my favorite texts. Wives, submit to your husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife. Where is a woman's place? Certainly not in the pulpit. That scripture from Ephesians, like many others, has been used by people who want to unseat God the judge, and in some cases use it to justify spousal abuse. How dangerous when we try to weed God's garden. And one of the most destructive events in Christian history is that of the Crusades, a war justified by those who put themselves in the seat of judgment to justify killing approximately one million people. It's the lower estimate. One million people in the name of God. Such is our human nature, to make judgments about what is good and what is not. Whether it's something so harmless as a meal at some restaurant, or a song we hear on the radio, or something like who belongs and who doesn't, we love to square things up. This parable today is Jesus warning us how great the dangers are when we act as judge. And this parable should stop us in our tracks. Jesus is acknowledging the realities of evil in this world and the need to eradicate it and the difficulty in doing so and the harm in thinking it is our job to do. The wheat and the weeds. It isn't an us versus them parable, but it does depict the conflict between those two. 
a conflict not just between people, but the conflict within our own heart. As Bob and I were talking about, and as the wisdom of Martin Luther said, we are both saint and sinner. There is that conflict of that binary nature within us. We are both saint. God has made us so. And we are sinner. Sins of this world. Both the wheat and the weeds. So what is a sinner to do? Knowing that we are not the ones able to weed out the sin and evil in this world. Well, most people are familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon and their 12-step program that leads people towards recovery and uh, lasting sobriety. It's a beautiful model and it begins with the admission, um, this admission. We are powerless over alcohol and our lives have become unmanageable. Hear it this way. There are weeds in my heart, and I cannot manage them or root them out on my own. The fourth step of these 12 steps is to do a fearless moral inventory, or in our context, a confession, acknowledging the weeds and also the wheat. Hear it this way. There are weeds in my heart and I cannot manage them or root them out on my own. At the start of worship, we take time to make that confession to God, a time of honesty and humility, and it is a necessity for our faith and relationship with God. It is the creating of good soil for the good seeds to thrive in. Well, many of you probably know the best way to get rid of weeds in our lawns. It's not with Roundup. The best way to get rid of weeds in your lawn is not to try to kill them, but to feed and nourish the good grass that is growing. And eventually that grass will become stronger and then overcome the weeds. Or in other words, overcome evil with good. That's our modern-day parable. A person went out to care for her lawn. She saw weeds and grass growing together. If she were to spray Roundup, she would kill the weeds, yes, but everything else along with it. But if she instead gives the soil and and grass plenty of light and food and water, the grass will strengthen and overcome the weeds. There's a pastor named Jonathan Brooke, and he says, you don't go into a dark room and turn off the light. Instead, you turn on the light. Turn off the dark, excuse me. You don't go into a dark room and turn off the dark. You turn on the light. We are called as disciples to be light, to sow love, to feed those who are hungry, and to teach about the power of God's life-giving water. In this parable, Jesus is acknowledging the realities of evil in our world, our need to eradicate it, the difficulty in doing so, and the harm in thinking that it is our job to do. It is not our job to try and weed God's garden. It is our call as disciples to sow love, on everything, the wheat and the weeds. And goodness will overcome evil. Well, after seeing my pitiful garden, my mom, who visited a few weeks ago, in a very loving and tender way said, well, how about you plant some, some new tomato plants in the front, <laughs> away from the chaos of your garden in the back? And so we did, planted two nice tomato plants up in the front, right by the door. And each time I come home or leave, I walk by those tomato plants. I see them all the time. I care for them all the time. A couple weeks ago, some of the leaves 
started to have some disease on them. And I took care of that before it got out of control. I was able to pull up one of these little tiny weeds we have right next to one of them before it got too big and out of control. A well-tended garden, our souls, is regularly nourished and cared for. It is the practice of confessing our sins, acknowledging those things in our hearts that would hurt us. It is the nourishing of our hearts with God's word and prayer and with service to God and our neighbor. And it is the wisdom of knowing we are not the ones who remove the seeds. That is the job and tenderness of our merciful gardener. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we are sorry for the things that we do that lead us from you. We are sorry for unseating you sometimes in the role of judge and hurting other people that you call us to love. Give us wisdom and patience to trust in your will and to trust in your word. These things we pray in your holy and precious name. Amen.